everyone, and welcome to the State of the School of Medicine Address. My name is Allison Montgomery, and I serve as the third year class president. I'm also a student on the Tuscaloosa Regional Campus. Today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Selwyn Vickers, the James C. Lee Jr. Endowed Chair, Senior Vice President for Medicine, and Dean of the UAB School of Medicine for his third State of the School of Medicine Address. Before I welcome Dr. Vickers to the podium, I'd like to share a quick story. As many of you know, when Dr. Vickers is not busy serving as the Dean of the School of Medicine, he's busy as a world-renowned surgeon. As a first year, I was able to attend one of his regular student lunches, where he hosts student leaders in his conference room to discuss School of Medicine happenings and solicit feedback. Somehow, after the topic of learning communities, the topic of pancreatic pathology came up probably because we as first years were in our GI module. Suddenly, Dr. Vickers was at the whiteboard, ferociously sketching the outline of a pancreas and its neighboring organs. We launched into the specifics of a particular surgery he'd done earlier that week and the significance of the accessory pancreatic duct. As we left his office, I thought about how our discussion had spiraled into a passionate lecture. From many of my classmates, I've heard that Dr. Vickers demonstrates this same passion for teaching in the OR. I know that this is what ultimately led him to the position he fills here as dean, but it encourages me to know that he hasn't lost an ounce of this spark throughout his career. As a student leader, I can attest to Dr. Vickers' student-centered nature as an educator. I want to thank you, Dr. Vickers, for being an exceptional role model and source of motivation. On behalf of the students, I'd like to express our appreciation to you on all that we see you do and all that we will never know you're doing to positively impact the School of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Selwyn Vickers. Thank you, Allison. I uh, appreciate the kind remarks and, and introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, just a couple of housekeeping. The work on this presentation um, began probably back in August, and Paige and Kendra Carter have given much of their time and effort and certainly are tremendously patient to put up with me. Kendra, thank you for your years of hard work in putting this together and all the time and effort. Um, we appreciate all the sweat equity that you've done to get this together. There are a number of people here, but thank you all for attending, for uh, working and what you do at UAB. Uh, I want to thank Bob Rich. Uh, Bob, thank you for your leadership that you provided, while Dean and Pam Benoit, our provost, is here. And all of our chairs and division directors, you really are our board of directors, if you would, for the school and UAB Medicine. Thank you for your leadership uh, and your contributions to make this a great place. So, Thank you for taking time and thank Chick-fil-A for, uh, for making it worthwhile coming. You know, each time this year, we, we do have to take a moment of silence to recognize people from our community who have passed away and no longer with us. Um, these individuals, Bill Dismukes, Bob Kynard, and James Schaefer are legends in their own right of what they mean to our UAB community. If you would, Let's take a, a moment of silence to recognize their life and their passing. Thank you. Um, leadership is a key part of what we do, and it's a key success to what we've had. And I want to take time to thank Ray Watts um, for uh, what he's done as president uh, and what he continues to do to help lead our complex and broad institution. I'm thankful for his vision, not only for UAB as drive, but also his vision for Birmingham and Alabama that really in, is seeking to improve who we are and what we do. So this idea of UAB medicine, you've heard more about, and the fundamental goals of this are to be top 10 in quality, top 10% in patient satisfaction, top 20 in NIH funding, and being a top destination for talent. Um, Will, myself, and I'll have quite a bit to say about Tony as we get into this lecture, uh, or this talk, 
really, these are the straightforward terms of where we want to go as an institution. So be mindful of everything that I talk about is eventually to drive us in this direction. So a snapshot of UAB. Um, nearly 1,500 faculty or well over 1,400, 136 new faculty recruited, 14,000 staff. Our match rate for our students that we launch out is 98% and sometimes higher. 805 medical students, over 1,000 residents. On our clinical side, almost a million ambulatory encounters. Another near 700,000 at the children's setting for our faculty there. Over 220 PhDs awarded. And the hospital is full to the tilt almost every day. We're 1,157 bed hospital and we're at a census over 900 almost at all times. So a very busy place and clearly one of the largest academic medical centers in our country. This statement, which we often show by Tinsley Harrison, really can be fit in the broad terms. Each of you here could be working somewhere else. Alabama Power, uh, you could be working for a bank. But you have the unique opportunity to be working as a part of an academic medical center. This statement speaks about there being no greater responsibility and obligation for being a physician, but I'd argue that expands that there's no greater responsibility or responsibility or opportunity being associated and working in an academic medical center. It, it really applies clearly for the doctors, it applies for the scientists, it applies for the staff, it applies for the students and residents as well. So we have a unique opportunity and a unique challenge ahead of us because of what we have the uh, responsibility to carry out. So if we look at this sense of values that define who we are, they're framed in these threefold topics that I'll go through briefly responsibility, opportunity, and impact. And obviously we could put a lot of things under these, but we're gonna just put a few things and talk about who we are at UAB in that context. So as it relates to responsibility, I, I, I would label this as the why, and I think we have this in, in covered better than most places in the world. As a leading academic medical center, we're clearly called to do a lot of things. We're called to train, we're called to actually discover, and we're called to take care of patients. But I would argue because of where we're in the Deep South, we have a greater burden. We're called to make a difference and a dent in the disparities in healthcare and disease that we see in this part of the world. There's no other institution who has that burden, and there's no institution that has that opportunity. We should never forget that but yet it's something that we should take advantage of and make a difference in the lives of both, not only our patients, but those who live in this Deep South region. So if you look at this burden, which is largely driven by disparities in healthcare, both ethnicity and income, Alabama has a unique position that's not enviable. We're number one in diabetes, we're number two in stroke, we're number three in heart disease, we're number nine, and sometimes, if you would, lower, if you would, six or seven sometimes in kidney disease and we're number one, 10 in cancer. That is a huge opportunity to make a difference. And it is the burden that we carry to make this difference realistic and make it being realized for our citizens. So these are our partners across this Deep South space. They're even more extensive if we were to add our clinical partners, but these are certainly our partners as we look at how we explore and move toward research and impacting translational science to make a difference in these communities. And you can see it extends outside of Alabama, obviously parts of northern Florida, but Louisiana and Mississippi as well. So if we also look at the responsibility we have, we have a responsibility internally to begin to make sure we create an environment that's both safe and healthy for both our physicians, our faculty that are researchers, as well as our staff and residents. What has become apparent is that burnout is a thing that is real and it's affecting numerous parts of our workspace. It increases medical errors, it increases the risk of medical malpractice, it certainly creates family and discord among the working environment and home environment, reduces compliance from patients, and it certainly affects patient satisfaction. If we look at our own house staff, and with data now showing that nearly 50% of physicians across the country experience some of the signs of burnout, 
we can see that in our overall house staff experience, that's already occurring with some of the highest levels existing here in our clinical environment for surgical, medical, and hospitalists. These issues are clearly challenges that we need to face and address in the world where we take care of individuals and try to make a difference in their lives. We have to make sure we stay healthy as well. So this depersonalization and emotional exhaustion is a real experience that many of our both faculty and house staff have felt. <coughs> to address that, David Rogers, who served as one of our senior associate dean now, has been appointed as our chief wellness officer. David has had a passion for this for some time and has looked both scientifically and clinically across the space of how we can make the difference. He's a firm believer in data, but he's also a firm believer in making interventions that can make a difference for our faculty. To start this off, one of our community organizations, to say one of our companies in our community, has stepped up and given us a gift. ProAssurance has given a $1.5 million gift to kick off support for an academic chair as well as research in this space. David's putting together a team who will work with him to explore both every aspect of this for physicians, for our faculty or researchers, for our house staff, as well as for the staff who work at UAB. In order to make that happen, we're starting at every level. In the student wellness arena, our leaders of our learning community, Carolyn Arada and Nick Van Wagner, are creating an environment where our students can bring their challenges to an area where they can feel safe. They can have conversations about those difficult cases they were engaged in. They can have that first conversation about a patient who dies while on service. And they can learn from others how they manage this and move forward and have an ability to actually remain strong and well themselves. As relates to our residents, this data has been generated by a number of our leaders. Tavo started this, but now Alice Gepford and Vanessa Lindemann will continue it, both surveying and asking all the relevant questions about the GME work environment and then beginning to design interventions so that the journey to becoming a faculty or physician is one where our residents can remain healthy. And then finally, we would be incomplete if we didn't have a mechanism for our broad staff to have a venue to begin looking at their own environment. <coughs> Amy Dean and Jennifer Spears have created the staff council, are part of leading the staff council, that allows opportunities for both open forums, it allows for collaborations, as well as for opportunities for their own wellness. You heard me mention the issue about disparities and also this issue about making that change and improving the outcomes. One of the other pillars for excellence for us and the responsibility we have is to have a diverse and inclusive environment. Mona Fuad and Deborah Grimes lead this, if you would, for UAB Medicine, and they've made a concerted effort both to educate our broader world for search committees and for our leaders to deal with unconscious, unconscious bias as well as creating an opportunity to remain and grow as a diverse environment. Alabama as a state is nearly 25 to 26 percent represented by minorities in its population. We often don't see that reflected at UAB at multiple spaces. Part of that is to make sure that we understand diversity in its core is about excellence more so than it is about equity. But this process is allowing us to make this not only a diverse but an inclusive environment. When we look at our medical student class, We've struggled over the years to get below above 10%. And for the first time now, we've approached 15% as a number of diverse students who are part of the entering class. I really give kudos to the interim group of admissions leaders and our current admissions director to continually push this model to make UAB more reflective, not only of Alabama, but of our country. When we want to look at creating that pipeline to continue that opportunity, our new degree, that is a Master in Biomedical Sciences, gives a unique opportunity for students who often come from underprivileged backgrounds or who come from less research-intense colleges. This master's degree prepares them for application to both medical school as well as other health profession programs, but increasing the diversity in our pipeline. In order to prepare our students to deal with the issues of disparities, the health equity scholars are a group of students that are selected to give them the real capacity to deal with the social environment, the economic systems, as well as the changes in healthcare that allow them to impact the rural and often impoverished areas of our state. And finally, 
probably one of the underlying key areas that have led to us having a reputation as an institution that's making a difference in the space of disparities is my Minority and Health and Research Center. This center is one of the formative ones in the country. It's had over 100 million in competitive research awards since 2005, just renewed with a large $7 million grant from the NIH, and it's provided a ton of pilot funding. Mona Fuad leads this, has been a national figure in this space. As you may have seen earlier, Mona is one of our first members elected to the National Academy of uh, Medicine in 21 years. Uh, Mona is well-deserving. She's an internationally and nationally known figure, and we're very appreciative that she's gotten that recognition as a member of what used to be the Institute of Medicine, but now the National Academy of Medicine. And this, if you would say, one of the things that makes UAB both fun and great is the diversity fair. That's coming up this week. This is where people from every walk of UAB and from every background bring their abilities and their taste buds to the diversity fair that brings the food and the origins that they come with to give us a taste of their world. Uh, you can see the participation was overwhelming. We're looking forward to this year. A ton of people have signed up to bring their food. Uh, even if you're not a good cook, um, but if you can do something that's different, bring it. The other factor that has been a responsible aspect of us as an institution was knowing what our space was and knowing how we use it. If we're going to reach this goal of moving well into the top 20, we have to have the space that's necessary to continually grow to do both our for our faculty clinical space as well as our research space. Um, we engage the Jacobs Group, which is a national consulting group, to really take us through an evaluation of our space, some 1.86 million square feet some 60 buildings that's given us really a comprehensive plan to know how we should organize, how we should account for, and what space we need to expand or contract in order to actually be our best and grow into the next level. So I appreciate the work done by Dr. Bindavanisti, Dr. Darley Ismar, and Chad Steele, who led this effort. It will pay dividends for years to come as we begin to implement it. So what about the opportunities we have? And, and we have a unique set of opportunities because we can, more than anybody else in our space in the Deep South, assemble talent that can actually not only take care of patients but move the needle in how we treat disease and how we actually begin to sometimes cure disease. So we're in that great area where we can attract those individuals to be a part of a workforce to not only great clinical care but great science and discovery. So one of the things that we have failed to do, but we finally did it, was to get orthopedic surgery launched as a department. It's been a part of our surgery department and it's thrived, but we realize that there is the next level of opportunity for this group of young faculty members to move forward. There are 30 surgeons, a number of advanced care providers. They're launched as our 27th department. They are a busy group of individuals, over 8,000 cases, doing everything from trauma to spine to hand to oncology. We now have an interim chair, Dr. Steve Tice, who is a spine surgeon and an outstanding leader, but we also have just launched a national search now. Dr. Anupam Agarwal and Dr. Amy McLean are leading this group. Uh, they have a number of applications and interested individuals, but hopefully by this time next year we'll have a new chair for this department. We're excited about the upside for this department. Our outside consultants who've looked at this says this is a huge opportunity to grow in numerous aspects, both research and clinical care and education. How about precision medicine? And this is a theme that's nationally growing that we believe will have a significant impact on healthcare, not only in the Deep South, but across the country. Our leaders, Matt Mike, who you've heard me introduce last year, but his partners, Eddie Yang, Nita Lemde, and Bruce Korf, who's our chief genomics officer, are a phenomenal team with both national, again, and international reputations. We're in great hands to both to make a difference in rare diseases, cancer biology, pharmacogenomics, as well as sequencing the broad number of individuals who we have as a part of our enterprise. If we look specifically at cancer, Mike Beer, our new director, as I'll introduce down the line, Mike clearly has a specific interest in this and wants the Cancer Center to play a huge role. So if you come to UAB now and you have a either rare or advanced cancer, 
you can get your cancer genome sequenced for free. Strata Oncology has a small cohort of academic medical centers who they have partnered with to expand the pool of genomes for clinical trials and targeted therapy, and we're one of those centers. So offering that for our citizens as the only place in our state to do that is great, particularly in this offer, it's for free. So for those rare recalcitrant tumors, for those advanced tumors, we can ask the questions, are there any targeted mutations that new drugs that have not worked yet can apply for these tumors? In addition, the TAPER trial, which is a unique ASCO trial that's asking the question about drugs that are already out there but have not been applied to specific cancer, can we now get a match between drugs that are approved and cancers that have failed treatment? There are 101 sites in 20 states. We're the only site in Alabama. Again, another precision medicine targeted approach that we can offer for almost all of our cancer patients as they come for treatment here. In addition, the Alabama Genome Initiative, you've heard me talk about, it's a five-year plan to begin the sequence of set of citizens from every county in the state of Alabama. The sequencing costs $100 in combination with Hudson Alpha. It gives those individuals who are found to have mutations in the 60 or 59 that the Genomic Society has identified. It gives that information back to them because they're actionable and they can affect generations in their families. Uh, probably somewhere between 1 and 4 percent of individuals will have something found. We've already uh, gone through 53 people from 53 different counties. Our goal is 67. Uh, next year, we're hoping to enroll 2,600. The goal eventually in the five-year period is, is 10,000. I'm appreciative of our partners to make this happen, but particularly our state to, to supply the $2 million to get this funded. We're also at some point will sequence over 250 people for their whole genome. This puts Alabama in a unique space. There's no state in the country that has this platform and this model to prepare its state both for the informatic platform, the education of primary care givers to have genetic counselors in order to have its citizens ready for precision medicine. The other part that we're able to participate in is not only the unique opportunity that we've presented for our state through the Alabama Genome Initiative, it's the All of Us program. And the All of Us Initiative is the National Institutes of Health's Precision Medicine Initiative. There are 10 sites across the country that will be participating in accruing a million citizens to have their genome sequenced. And they're actually asking questions of us to some degree, how do you give information back? They're learning from our Alabama Genome Initiative because we've designed it nicely to return information and to ask what's relevant to give back. So as they evolve their program, we've been funded as the first cohort, and now we're applying for the next cohort. The first cohort is a million dollars. The second cohort for the next four years is potentially anywhere from 10 to 12 million dollars a year. It gives us a great opportunity to play the space again in the Deep South. So if you're a citizen of Mississippi, if you're a citizen of Louisiana or Alabama, your opportunity to be counted in the nation's sequencing of the million people is tied to UAB. If you are a diverse citizen of America, guess what? If you're in the Deep South, you get an opportunity to be counted as well because that diversity doesn't mimic the rest of the country. It's uniquely here. So we own this space and it's important for our country that UAB is here and it's important for the citizens of Alabama and the other states that we surround ourselves with. The other part of this is the CSER grant, and this is a collaboration with Hudson Alpha. It's a clinical se sequencing grant that will be sequencing neonates of, of looking at their diagnosis and their birth defects, as well as genetic order disorders. This is led by Greg Broch and Bruce Korf as co-PIs, and again, it's an opportunity at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, as well as Children's and UAB, where we will be one of the leaders in the country and asking the questions about the genome and genetic defects in children. And finally, the other area where we've handed Steve Rowe, who's the leader of our Cystic Fibrosis Center, UAB has played a unique space in cystic fibrosis. This is one amazing area that's changed over the last 20 years where if you got this diagnosis, your life expectancy was short, but it's improved significantly. The EXPAND trial looking at a specific genetic mutation F508 DEL, that, that mutation only occurs in about 8% of the patients, but the drugs that you see, Avicaftor and Tezacaftor, 
are specific targeted drugs in combination that have been the first time in a clinical trial shown improvement in lung function. That again is a space where we've targeted drugs to a specific genetic defect in a select group of patients and now showing it makes a difference. And so again, a role of precision medicine that UAB is taking the opportunity to lead our country. And this final piece is again looking at where we can make a difference in drug development, particularly in a targeted fashion. We've clearly come through understanding the power of viruses. We don't have to go back to think about Ebola. We can just think about influenza and what it's done to our hospital and our population. And our treatments are clearly inadequate. And this U35 that's getting ready for his renewal, uh, led by Rich Whitley, is one of the premier groups in the country looking, some at, looking with some of the best virologists to ask what therapies can be developed and how can we make a difference, not only in outbreaks for viruses that haven't had therapy and we don't often see coming in the humans, but for the practical influenza that makes a, and wreaks havoc each year around this time of the season. This is led with Oregon, North Carolina, Vanderbilt, and Colorado, but UAB is the lead place to make this happen and Southern research. If we also look at this other unique opportunity that's evolving, and this is in the concept of transplantation. As you saw, we are number one or nine or eight in a number of diseases that lead to renal failure. Whether it's diabetes or hypertension or kidney disease alone, we lead the world in creating that as a problem. And subsequently, we will never have enough human organs to make this go away. Nearly 2,000 people are on the waiting list, or over 2,000 people on the waiting list, over 115,000 people waiting for organs. Every 10 minutes, a new person's put on the list, and probably in that same order, every day someone dies. David Cooper and Joe Tector, who really are renowned leaders in this space of asking the biological questions, not just can you take an organ from a pig, but can you design the pig, can you create the receptability in a, in a human to make this a reality. Clearly our ability to edit genes and our understanding of the immune system and that growth has made this a possibility. It's the vision of the Department of Surgery and the school and their leaders with Devin Eckhoff and I mentioned David and Joe and they've added Chris McGregor who's probably one of the leaders in heart xenotransplantation to be the first in the world in putting a pig kidney in a human. Another example where as an institution where we stand and what we do can have not only local, national, but global significance. We had our first, maybe not our first, but one of many to come strategic recruitment research retreats. And it was a productive time. I commend Dr. Benavenisti and the team, Tony Leaf, Lakeisha Mack, a, a whole group of individuals who put their effort in to making this happen. And our chairs and our scientists who came and who heard the sense of urgency that we need to do to continue to grow. But we heard that it needed to be different, not this sort of organic growth, but it really needed to be strategic and collaborative. Now this little acronym, I came up with all by myself. Um, <laughs> it's strategic and manageable means sustainable. That S didn't go in that spot, but we made it manageable. Aligned, resource, and transformative. Uh, but forget the acronym, we do need to be smart as we go forward. But we must grow, we must continue to do that. Uh, it's again, like you've heard me say, it's like walking up a downward escalator. If you stop, you go backwards. And so I appreciate the work. Victor, I'm not sure what you're saying, but you look really intense in the picture. Um, I appreciate all the hard work that's been done and to be done. Next is our research round table, and that's where we will begin to bring our individuals with posters and participation broadly from around the School of Medicine to present and talk about these five core areas that we've identified as our substantive areas that we want to focus and grow on. There will be outside speakers and there will be inside speakers. Tuesday, March the 13th, you hear more about it, but we want you all to be there to participate down at the Sheraton downtown. Here's our, our, our data, and the data is compelling again. I'll start on the far right you know, for the first time probably in 20 years, we're over 300 funded PIs. And, and that was one of the goals that I set forward when we first started. You all have driven that by making sure people here stay funded, and you've driven it by also recruiting new people here who've brought funding. Over to the next slide, 
we've grown the dollar. So not just we've added people, but we've added legitimate money. And, and that growth has often sometimes been in a flat NIH budget. We believe it's going to grow substantially, but we're nearly close to our $200 million peer, to, I mean, uh, mark. We had 195 million, and we've continued to grow that from 133 to 195. That's significant. Very few, the data would argue there are very few schools, one or two at best, that have grown greater than that percentage. But what's most compelling, we, this number has been 22 or 23. It's changed just because last year, when Vanderbilt was separating from their university, they were not included, so they're inserted back in. So essentially, we've stayed flat. But the understanding is that we've added more people and more dollars, <coughs> and yet have stayed flat. And you've heard me say to grow in number, you not only have to grow at a rate that adds volume and number of dollars into this, but you have to grow a rate that's faster than people above you. So people above us are growing. So all the more, we can't stand still because people below us are growing as well. So this is an important piece. It's not just a numerical number, but it's also reaching our full capacity to make the impact we want in this community, in the Deep South, and in our country. So keep abreast of these. The message is don't stop growing. We must continue to do it. To do that, we got to have great people. And, and these people are both internal and external. Mike Beer, you've heard us talk about. Mike is our leader of our cancer center. <coughs> he has a number of things on his plate. He's an excellent clinician scientist. The job of cancer center director is not only research, but it's also helping move a cancer clinical service line moving forward. Uh, that piece is a bigger part of the job and requires a lot of work. David Bedwell has stepped up and done a great job in our biochemistry department, was appointed as full-time chair. Um, Bill Carroll is our chair of otolaryngology, outstanding clinician and translational science. Devin Etkoff, now in the interim director of our CTI. Um, Alice Gepford, as you know, a, a really phenomenal maternal fetal medicine, but a passionate physician, but a passionate educator. And uh, we're excited about her in this space. And Tavo, who's taken on the role of, uh, of being our regional dean in Montgomery. And we are appreciative of his leadership as he follows Wick Manny in that role. This other layer, Tony Jones, you'll hear me speak about, but Tony is not only the chief physician executive, he's the senior associate dean of clinical affairs, and he's the president of HSF. He is the busiest man on the planet. Um, and Tony is a um, tremendous resource because of the spaces that he covers, because of the experience he's had as a chair, and because of his accomplishments as a leader. So we are very appreciative in that role that he's carrying, and there's a lot that are on his shoulders. You've heard me talk about Matt Might. Matt is leading our Hugh Call Precision Medicine Program. Matt, previously from Utah and Harvard, led President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative for the White House. We're extremely excited to have him here and what his team is going to produce. Johan Peiste, our interim chair in anesthesia. Gene Siegel, not only Gene served as an interim chair in pathology, Gene now has served as an interim chair in genetics. But we're appreciative of him stepping up and to serve as a leader. And you heard me mention Steve Tice. Brad Yoder, we were excited to have Brad in this role an accomplished scientist, well-funded, and, and a great leader for this department. The Pittman Scholars, this is our pipeline of not just recruiting people from the outside, but making sure we promote our junior faculty and the next generation of scientists at UAB. Dr. Agarwal has passionately taken this on with our leaders in the school to make sure each year we identify bright young individuals who are funded, who are outstanding individuals in their space where they operate and take care of either their labs or in clinical spaces where they do clinical research. We're excited about the three years. We're going to promote some of these guys out because you're not going to be a Pittman Scholar for, well, you are a Pittman Scholar forever, but you don't get the funding forever, I should say. <laughs> Once you get identified, you get to keep that title. So this year's Pittman Scholars are as follows. Uh, you haven't seen this publicly. I think they know, though. Dan Chu in surgery, uh, Jody Dion Odom in uh, medicine, Jeremy Herskowitz in neurology, Anita Gemelin in uh, C-Dib, and Kelly Hinman in medicine. So let's give them all a hand of applause. <laughs> they get support from an endowment that helps sponsor some of the aspects of their research. Most of all, I think, beyond the dollars, they get the recognition as our future. 
as our future leaders who we are counting on to both excel and make a difference both here at UAB and nationally. So how do we sustain and support all of this activity? Well, we, we clearly need philanthropy. And we were fortunate, and we've been fortunate each day, we find individuals who are passionate about UAB. And we're a unique space. A large part of our donors have never been to school here. Uh, they didn't train here. But they, many simply recognize that this is a space, this is a place that's about excellence in what they're trying to do. Whether it's in the educational space, the research or clinical care, those are the factors that really drive many of our donors. Um, and so we value that, and that's why we value our ability and our willingness to continually push ourselves to grow. So we're at $857 million toward our billion dollar goal. Nearly 70% of that, if you would, is for the School of Medicine, or 64.5%, if you want to be completely accurate. Nearly 100,000 donors, 553. Now, just so that you understand, this is not my money. Uh, most of this... <laughs> Most of this is in the hands of departments and faculty, and to contrary belief, most of this is money that's tied toward endowments and it's not free discretionary. Yet we appreciate every cent of it. So, but don't, don't think that the chairs or I have just a half a billion in our pockets that's free to deal with, but we need every dime to be who we want to be. Uh, our scholarships in the med school are phenomenal. We just had one group give another donation for our students. So, 2.94 million given annually to 171 out of 805 students. We'd love that number to be 200 students who have scholarships, or 300. To reduce the debt of our students gives them the freedom to go make a difference in people's lives. If we look at what's driven the research space, this concept of the academic enrichment fund, are these dollars that actually are now geared toward research infrastructure and now will be tied to space as well. Our goal is 55 million. We had 35 million last year. As you'll see, we've had a drop in what we could get in funding because our clinical enterprise is still trying to recover from decreased reimbursement and challenges in the healthcare environment. Next year, we're moving hopefully toward the 32 million, but this decrement is something that we feel, but we feel it not only because we don't get the money, it's because the rest of our system is also needing our support to continually grow and reach its margins. What have the dollars have been used for? And let me be clear where the money comes from. The money comes from uh, our health system, which is through Viva or Triton, our hospital, and it comes from our practice plan, the HSF. So our faculty contribute, our health system, our practice plan, and you contribute those who obviously use Viva. It comes from the school as well that contributes to it. These dollars have been used in this fashion, and we have a significant amount that's there to support programs and leaders. Over 108 million in packages, some 50 million in institute and centers, and then the others for retentions of individuals. And we have to be good stewards to make sure it's used in an accountable fashion, and most of all, that we get the results we want from it. So this is what I mentioned about our health system's margin. Um, it's what we face daily in trying to make sure the economic engine that drives any academic medical center who we want to either aspire or who we are today is driven by the success of our full tripartite mission. And one of the key parts of that mission, if not the biggest we have, is that clinical function that we have. And so you've seen the success we've had over the years, and yet you see the challenge we face in 2017. We want to get back clearly to a 3% margin. That's where we feel comfortable that we can help support a large part of the mission. We want to be bigger. We've said clearly that on this footprint alone, it's hard to be who we want to be if UAB is just this campus. So we need to expand, and we're trying to do that. We've also said that the revenues we get, three to four billion, are not enough to go where we want to go. We need to be more like five or six billion. All of those things are things that we work on daily. Dr. Fernandi and his team and others work on to try to move it, because the drive for growing our hospital is largely to support our broader academic mission. And that's the thing, the, the JOLC, which includes our chairs and Tony, myself, and Will, those are the issues that we face on a regular basis to drive us to this next level. This is why the AEF is down, and, and we're not suffering just because it's down. We're challenged because we want our hospital to be at a level where it's healthy, making the margins it needs to do all the things it needs to do, capital improvements, as well as the AEF. The key leaders who are operationally driving this are these individuals on this picture. 
and they are experienced and we have great confidence in what they're doing. But clearly, we want to be a place where quality is a part of our DNA. We clearly want to be smart, not only in reducing our cost, but we want to improve our revenues. We, we are a big hospital, and, and we have a lot of cases in our hospital that are community-level care, and we take care of everybody. But what our state needs us to be is a tertiary hospital. We need the ability to do the volume of tertiary care that our state needs and our region needs. Not only because of that care delivery, because that also is where reimbursement is best for us. That's a sweet spot for us. And where, in order to make that happen, we need to reduce length of stay. We need to get people out in a healthy and a timely fashion. This morning, we had 50 patients boarding in the emergency room. To some degree, because they couldn't get into our hospital because we're full. And we're full with flu, we're full with, you know, a lot of things that while people who need either cardiac bypass, uh, a major liver resection, major spine reconstruction often can't get in, or with serious medical illnesses that don't need procedures often can't get in. Um, but we have to continually push ourselves to be efficient, and we're an outlier national in length of stay. And so we know that it's not just because we got sicker people and we're bigger than others. We can do better, and that is what these individuals are driving us to do. So what is our impact, and what areas do we need to impact? We've talked about the responsibility, the broad set of diseases that we have in our state. We've talked about the opportunity in some unique areas we're growing in. Most of you've heard about this significant opioid problem. And we are number one again in something that's not so good. We're number one in the nation in opioid prescriptions per capita. And we now, too, need to take the lead in addressing this issue. We've had an increase in overdoses by a number that is hard to read and understand, 269%, where individuals have intentionally or unintentionally created a loss of life. And when you look at that loss, it's not only a person gone, but obviously those around them who remain who are suffering. But we are doing things. Karen Cropsey's done a, a phenomenal thing. And we know naloxone is on emergency vehicles and it's in the hospital. But what her effort is, is to get naloxone in the hands of loved ones, caregivers, who might be able to apply that to someone who finds themselves in a position where they've overdosed and a loved one is the first there on the site, not an ambulance or an EMT, but in fact an individual who can give the saving uh, dose of a naloxone and save a life. 32 individuals have had overdose reversals. So that in the hands of family members has made a difference. In addition, Jeremy Day's work, asking the question at the molecular level, understanding that dopamine is somehow surging in the brain in that context of when someone is addicted and how do you block those pathways and keeping recircuitry from a happening, <coughs> circuitry for occurring that creates an addictive behavior is some exciting work that he's doing early on, but really an exciting area that we believe will contribute to our understanding of how to break the cycle and keep these drugs from being addictive. In addition, Stephen Cortez and Mark Bailey are national leaders. Dr. Cortez has been cited, his work has been cited as the most, has been found to be the most cited publication in 2017 in the substance and abuse area. And he's been one of the nation's top authorities in the opioid addictions. He's briefed the Surgeon General, he's become one of the individuals that a country looks to to speak in a coherent fashion about the opioid addiction. Mark Bailey has helped the State Federation of State Medical Boards, a panel of 15 experts, to advise on a national scale how states should manage this in the context of its physicians, both from their own problems, but also how they do prescribing. And so if you look at that, these are areas where we're making a difference in a clearly crisis area of our country. Then you've heard me say that our mission is to not only produce scientists, physician scientists and researchers, but we also have that part of our mission for driving primary care. Many of our states have less than two to three physicians, sometimes only one primary care doctor. There are states where many of our counties where kids have never seen a pediatrician. So we have 62 of our 67 states are understaffed in their primary care needs. Many don't have surgeons. Forget specialists. We're just talking access for primary care physicians 
and that's still a major gap in care delivery in our state. Our programs in the medical school are now also not only focused on that sort of scientific faculty development piece, but also producing primary care doctors. Our primary care track now is a distinct track that you can be admitted into our medical school that will take you primarily to our Tuscaloosa campus. We expect to have about 24 students in the inaugural year, and that marches you through a dedicated set of training that will in, hopefully end you into a family medicine residency or another primary care specialty that will allow you to serve in that space. We have also have an emphasis of that in Huntsville, an integrated family medicine track, where we begin, <coughs> begin to recruit students in their fourth year as they start both planning what they would do, they are in sessions that are engaged with the family medicine residents, and if they choose this, they are also promoted with a scholarship to move into the family medicine residency program in Huntsville. And finally, the Montgomery campus was in large part grew out of this initiative to provide more primary care physicians for the river area of our part of the state and the central south part of our state. That effort will continually go forward as we have 20 students now each year now initially inaugurated by Dr. Manny, now led by Dr. Hudebert, again with the focus of getting as many students as we can focused in the primary care space for our state and for the region. So in that process, not only do we want more primary care doctors, we also want to be able to use telemedicine. So both e-medicine and our telemedicine program is beginning to expand to impact our state broadly. Um, we just recently got a grant that a close to a half a million dollars federal award that will allow us now to be able to connect broadly to some of our rural hospitals. You can see the number of miles that have been um, saved uh, by the telemedicine program. We believe this will be the next advent of making an impact in healthcare in our state and our leaders have done a phenomenal job. So what about our funds? As you know, when I get to the money, we're getting close to the end. This is where our dollars come from. A large part of them are driven from our clinical resources and our federal grants. Um, you see the philanthropy contribution. What you do notice, though, is that we don't, we're not driven a large part by our tuition, right? So tuition doesn't drive a large part of who we are. Um, you can see that although we're a state school, only 12% of our funding comes from our state. So our, we're, we're sort of incongruent economically with our state. We couldn't live off just state funding. So although we appreciate all of that, it's essential to our success. We realize that to do who we, be who we want to be and do the things we want to do, it's bigger than some of those things alone. So we often focus on those other areas to be able to grow our revenue. And this is where the funds grow. Uh, they, they largely go back appropriately to our departments and our centers on the campus. Grants are used in the fund. Um, you also see that some of it's used towards space. And appropriately, uh, the school infrastructure itself is, is a small part, and, 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 and that's the appropriate size. But those are where the dollars go to. The, the ability for us to succeed, though, as you've heard us talk about this organizing for success as we move toward it and we've gotten through the first phases, the boards in some ways are now balanced. The UAB Medicine Board, um, Health Service Foundation Board share the leadership there. Um, the HSF Board, the dean is a more significant participant. The HSF president is a part truly of the school and the health system. Um, the HSF president is a full-time individual who, as we've talked about Tony Jones, we have a joint operating leadership council that's more strategic and seeking to have an impact in how we make decisions and move forward in the context of our overall UAB medicine. And you talked to, you heard me spoke about Tony. Uh, Tony has, um, is clearly the right person at the right time for this position. Um, he has a number of responsibilities that look at the clinical arm and also look at the School of Medicine for our faculty. He has that overall responsibility as president of the HSF. But I think what he represents most is physician leadership. What we missed in this structure is having doctors in the space to help lead our clinical enterprise. Doctors who have an academic ethos and as well as an academic culture and track record of success who now are engaged in the overall leadership of our UAB medicine enterprise, both clinically as well as on the research side. So I appreciate Tony in this role, what he's doing and what he will do in the upcoming future. These are some of the goals for the HSF 
a board retreat uh, coming up in the next two or three months, further advancing ourselves as a multidisciplinary practice plan, and then moving to develop a cohesive group around pediatric care with the so-called pediatric HSF. Finally, this idea that we are multiple groups, the school, the HSF, the hospital, we're trying to move and we are moving away. We are UAB medicine, one group. As we succeed, we all benefit. As we struggle, we all somehow fall short. But as we work together, we can all make a difference to make us each other better. So as we move toward a cultural change and move toward a definition, we want to make sure that you all understand this is how we should see ourselves under the UAB medicine umbrella, really focusing on that full scope of the mission, not only education and research, but also our clinical world as well. Our next generation health system is expanding to make that picture a bigger one and more successful. We've added the hospital where I was born at Brian Whitefield Memorial in Demopolis. Montgomery hospitals are part of that. We've added these two other rural hospitals, John Paul Jones and L.V. Stabler. And these are the single only hospitals in these rural parts of Alabama. Um, they are the largest economic centers in those parts of the state. And having them linked to UAB is an essential part of their survival and their future. And so we're excited about that connection as well. So, so what did we talk about? We, we talked about what defined our values. The responsibility that we have as one of the premier academic medical centers in America and arguably, clearly, the premier public academic medical center in the Deep South. Uh, that responsibility is a unique role of why we exist. Not only to provide great care, but we also have the burden for discovering science and translating that to make differences in health outcomes for our citizens where we live. We also have the ability and the capacity to assemble a pool of talent, a, a, a nidus of talent to really push those agendas like no other place in our area that we can. We have the opportunity to do some things that no one in the world can. You've heard about what we're doing in precision medicine. You've heard about what we can do in impacting disparities. You've heard about the opportunities that we have in transplantation. And you've heard about the opportunities we have in cancer. All of those are things that we can really own as a space like no one else in the world. And the impact that we have, we can see every day. Um, we see it not only as we talked about the practicality as it relates to opioids, we see it as it relates to primary care, but we see it daily in the citizens of this state as we take care of them, as we also discover new ideas. If you haven't seen it, we have something called a discovery of the month. We're gonna highlight a scientific discovery that's been published at UAB each month that we want our scientists to know that the value they perceive is not just in the journal, but we want the broad UAB community, community to see their publications and their science. So with that said, thank you for the privilege of allowing me to present where the school is and the privilege to serve as your dean. Thank you all. If there are any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Uh, the school's been incredibly successful over the last five years, and that success creates a huge amount of busyness. Uh, I'm attending now, one of my third year students asked, how do you, make, how do you keep the time to stay curious? Uh, our faculty are seeing more and more patients. Uh, they feel like they're running faster. Um, our staff, you know, oftentimes are working really hard. We've created a lot more work in being so successful. I mean, how do we, as a community, support each other better in that work, uh, love your, your thoughts. And it definitely relates to the wellness issue, but uh, it's great to have David in that position, but how can we as a community do more there too? You know, I, I think we have to be intentional in actually looking at both a couple things. How do we stay healthy as a community uh, and practically think about things that actually drive that health? And then I also think we have to be intentional how we have fun, right? And I, and I think I, I don't have an answer for the work going away because I don't think it will. Um, but I think that the thing that makes the work palatable is to actually enjoy what you're doing and the people you're doing it with. And I think we have to continually make intentional efforts 
to create an environment where we as individuals stay healthy because when we are not, we don't get along well. And secondly, that we actually create uh, intentional encounters that are just for fun. Um, I know this wasn't fun, but the food was probably good. <laughs> but we need, we need to do that. Um, uh, Tony, you have any ideas on that? I know you see it on a regular basis. I'm sorry about that. So, you know, um, part of the challenge is that we, we're going to have to kinda sort of rethink uh, how we're working. And um, we, we tend to function um, historically in, in uh, separate units. And um, to the extent that we can look at ways of integrating how we practice, think through very carefully who's doing what. And um, I, I think that we can begin to make some strides. But just doing the same stuff harder or faster probably won't get us there. And there are some substantial opportunities for that that are emerging. Other questions? Good. Thank you all. <laughs>